Chapter 13, Graphical and Tabular Displays of Data. We're going to start off from here on out looking at some statistics topics, beginning with section 13.1, frequency tables, relative frequency tables, and bar graphs. When we start to look at the statistical topics from here on out, uh, one of the things we're always going to be considering is whether we have categorical or numerical data or what type of data we have. So let's define those two types. A categorical variable, also referred to as qualitative in, in some other books, um, is a variable that consists of names or labels. The values of this type of variable tends to be given in words rather than numbers. And we are placing a piece of data into a category rather than giving it a numerical value. On the other hand, a numerical variable, sometimes also called a quantitative variable, that's what you'll probably hear it referred to as in statistics, consists of measurable quantities. And the value of this type of variable are given as numbers. And to truly be numerical, the numbers must have a mathematical value rather than just serving as a label. We'll see some examples down below of what I mean by that. So let's go ahead and jump into those examples. Classify each of the following as categorical or numerical. The amount of rainfall in each month of a year in Chattanooga, Tennessee. So you think about during a month what might be the amount of rainfall they get there and if it would be something like 13.7 inches then what we need to realize is we're giving a number so that would be numerical. And that's it. So typically when you're trying to do one of these you want to think about it like I did there. What is an example of a piece of data you might collect and then just pay attention to is that a word or is it a number? The breeds of 120 purebred dogs. So we start going through the dogs. We hear things like German Shepherd, and because that's a name, that would be categorical. The gold medal count of each of the teams in the 2010 Olympics. So we might say, how many gold medals did the USA have? And I don't know off the top of my head, but you know, let's say it was. 42, that's a number, so that would be numerical. And then to a final one and a bit of a tricky one, the zip code of a randomly selected American. So we could give a zip code like for Chabot, I believe it's 94545. And so because that's a number, you tend to think, okay, that's going to be a numerical variable. But I would say this is a case where that number doesn't really have any meaning as a number. So there would never be a case where you would like take seven people's zip codes and average them because they don't really have a numerical value. They're more of just uh, using that number to label where the person lives. So even though we're answering that as a number, uh, that number would never really get used in the way numbers are. You don't add zip codes, you don't average them, things like that. So I would say that even though it is a number, it's still going to be considered categorical. All right, so data, which I made a reference to up above, when we start observing and collecting values of a variable, these observations are considered to be data. Sometimes to kind of simplify the idea, I'll say that the question is the variable and then the answer is a piece of data. So just kind of running through these here, the amount of rainfall, is the variable and something like 13.7 inches would be a piece of data. Um, the breed of the dog would be the variable and then something like a Lhasa Apso would be a piece of data. Um, the gold medal count is the variable, something like 42 gold medals is a piece of data. Um, zip code is the variable and then 94545 would be a piece of data. All right. All right, now that we've seen the different types of data, we're going to look at grouping data. So when we've collected any substantial amount of data, it becomes useful to organize the results into a table. And then the way this works will vary slightly depending on whether our data is categorical or numerical. We're going to focus on categorical for data for now. We'll take a look at how it works with numerical a bit later. So here are the countries of the top 22 women in the 2013 Chicago Marathon. 
and they want us to make a frequency and relative frequency table and we're going to do that by the country of origin for these top 23 so they've listed them Kenya Ethiopia and the US and for frequency you're just going to count how many times something happens so we're just going to go through and say all right how many times did Kenya show up here and I think it's good to cross them off as you go through just to kind of make sure you've addressed every piece of data in the chart so for Kenya there's one and it looks like just two and then for Ethiopia there's one two three and now you could think about this like if there's 22 women in this table and we've already taken care of five of them there should be 17 left through subtraction so there's a temptation to just fill that in but you do want to make sure you didn't miss anything so let's just count up all the US ones and see if it is indeed 17 so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So it is easy to miss a piece of data when you're going through on a chart like this. So I would encourage you to always cross off and count every one. And then when you do add them up, 3 plus 17 is 20, plus 2 is 22. Make sure you get the total that you were supposed to. All right, so we filled in frequencies there. So let's go ahead and fill in the definition of that as well. The frequency for a category is just the count of the number of items in the data set that fits into that category. So just like we did going through and counting up how many fit in there. So now they want us to do relative frequency. So let's see what that is. The relative frequency is just the ratio or the proportion of the data set that falls in that category. Relative frequencies are generally, uh, generally calculated as a fraction. And then we usually write them as a decimal and we interpret them using percentages. So we'll see all of that as we go through the table. So if we want the relative frequency for Kenya, we want the ratio of women in this table that are from Kenya. So we take the two women from Kenya, we divide that by the 22 women that are represented in the table. And there's the fraction that we're using to calculate. Here's the decimal that we would write down. Typically with relative frequencies and statistics, we like to use at least four decimal places. So that's what I'm going to do here. 0909, so 1, 2, 3, 4. Next digit is 0, so we stick with the 9. And then we just kind of keep going with those. So looking at the ones that remain in the table for the next one, which I think is Ethiopia, we do 3 out of 22 as the fraction. And then that is 0.136. Okay, this time it's a 3, but followed by a 6, so I'll round that up to 4. And then for the US, it's 17 out of 22, which would be 0.7727. And we have a total box here, and we are going to add those up. So I'll put all those in 0 0.0909 plus 0 0.1364 plus 0 0.7727. And before I press enter, I just want to think about what this should add up to. We have 2 over 22 plus 3 over 22 plus 17 over 22. That should be 22 over 22, which would be 1. I press enter, I do in fact see a 1. I would like you when you write these to put the same number of decimals in the total as you did here. And the reason I want you to do that is sometimes because of the rounding, which brings in error. We don't end up with the total of 1 like we're supposed to. And I want us to be able to see if there's a rounding error build up here. When that happens, you'll tend to get answers like 1.0001 or maybe 0 0.9999. If that happens, just put the total that you actually get there. All right. So this is just a note for that right there. Except for possible rounding error, the total of the relative frequency column should always be equal to 1. All right. So that is an example of a grouped data table with frequencies and relative frequency for categorical data. And the next thing we often do once we've grouped data is do a graph for it. And for categorical data, that's usually a bar chart. So let's look at that definition. A bar chart is used for categorical data to illustrate either the frequencies or the relative frequencies for the categories. As we look through the next few pages, we'll see some examples of those. All right, so here's an example of a bar graph. A survey of 2,050 American tech employees revealed that 389 of them had stolen at least one object from their work, used the bar chart of the reason provided 
below to answer the questions that follow. So here's our bar chart and we're going to think about what that's telling us by answering the questions. So estimate the number of tech employees who said that they stole because they were frustrated by their job. So we just got to go find that right there, frustrated by their job. And then we can see the bar graph and they say the number. So the number would be just the count and count is frequency, which is the way this is labeled. So I would go to the height of that bar and I'd just go across until I hit the graph and I'm just trying to estimate what is that. Maybe that's about a third of the way up, a third of 25 is maybe somewhere around 16. If I had 75 plus 16, maybe that's around 91 employees. Now I'm just really kind of making an estimate, right? I said that uh, because I can't tell for sure what the exact height of that bar is. It definitely needs to be more than 75 and it definitely needs to be less than 100 and it should probably be closer to 100 than 75 just based on where the bar is between those two lines. But we're not all going to agree every time on the answers here. As long as we're in the same neighborhood, that should be fine. Alright, so notice just kind of the point then of the bar graph, right? The bar graph is telling us the counts um, in a visual way. But the other thing we notice really quick with a bar graph is like what's the most common reason that people are stealing? Apparently it's that they're addicted to stealing. What's the least common reason somebody gives for saying uh, they stole? And it's like just that they were too lazy to buy it for themselves. So that's all kind of quick to see most common to least common in the bar graph. So that's the main advantage, but we definitely want to be able to read off answers like this as well. All right, now we're going to go ahead and take a look at some um, words that are used to combine events. So let's see how that works. Estimate the number of tech employees who said they stole because they wanted, uh, they wanted the object or they needed the object. So either because they wanted it or because they needed it. So here's they wanted the object right here. And then here's they needed the object here. And when you get asked to do an OR question and there's more than one bar that meets the description, then what you want to do is add the totals for those two bars. So that means we need to try and estimate both of those totals, looking at those who wanted it, just a little bit above this line, which would be 50. So maybe that's around 58. I thought that one was a 91, so I'll label that there too. Now this one, for they needed the object, that kind of appears to be, I don't know, just the tiniest bit above the line. Maybe that's like 51. So how many people said it was because they wanted it? 58. How many said it was because they needed it? 51. Again, those are our estimates. And then because they said or, I'm going to add those together. Now there are times where you have to be careful with that, but not when the bars are separate. So we'll look at those cases where you have to be careful a little later. And then we just go ahead and add these two together. So 58 plus 51 is 109 uh, tech employees would fit into that category. Just notice I said employees here and tech employees there. Given the context, either one of those should be fine. All the employees we're talking about here are tech employees. All right, in the final part, estimate the relative frequency of the tech employees who did not say they stole because they were addicted. They did not say they stole because they were addicted to stealing. All right, so addicted to stealing is the first one. So that's not the one we want. We want all of these. So we've already estimated three. We could estimate the other two and we could add them together. And those are the ones who did not say they were addicted to stealing. That's one way you could do it. But anytime you find you're going to add up more than half of the items, it's usually better to subtract away the ones you don't want from the total. So there were 389 employees total in this table. So what I want to do is take that value of 389 and I want to subtract, whoops, 389, I want to subtract the ones who did not answer or who did answer this way and then I get all the ones who did not answer that way. So estimating the number who said they stole because they were addicted to stealing, uh, that's a little closer to the hundred. I don't even know, maybe. Let's see, let's draw that line over. It's almost right in the middle. Maybe that's a tiny bit closer to 125 than 100. I'll put my estimate there as 113, almost directly in the middle. And I'm going to say that 
it's 389 minus those 113. I'll do that subtraction over here off on the side. And I get 276 employees. So notice when they said not, first thing you want to do is think about, all right, who did not say they were addicted to stealing? All these people. And then you could just count all those up. Or you could take this part and uh, subtract it from the total, which is what I chose to do. Either one would give you a decent estimate. It's nicer here because we're only estimating one bar instead of estimating five of them. And there's some error in our estimation. So it's probably better to use something where we only estimated once. All right, so some summaries of some of the words we saw. We're going to see and and or and not show up in various places. We haven't seen the and yet, but when this word is used with two categories, only consider observation, observations that the two categories have in common. Now, I don't even think that was really a possibility on this chart, so they didn't ask us any of the and questions yet, but those will be coming up. And this can also be thought of as the overlap of the two categories. So again, we'll return to ands later. Here come the ones that we already saw in our examples. Or, when this word is used with two categories, count all of the items in the first category, and then add in items from the second category that you haven't counted yet. That's important when there's overlap. There's no overlap in these. So be careful not to double count the observations in the overlap. Again, we'll see an example of that, I think coming up pretty soon, but that didn't really show up here. But you do have to be careful not to double count the observations that the categories have in common when that is a possibility. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next page and look at the not definition. And finally, the definition for not. When this word is used, count all of the observations in the data set except for those that follow the word not. And as we saw in the previous example, it's often useful to subtract from the total when you're thinking about one of those not type of questions. All right, another kind of situation we can look at with bar graphs is multiple bar graphs. A multiple bar graph is a graph that has two or more bars for each category of the variable described on a horizontal axis, and these are often used to make comparisons. So let's make some comparisons here. In 1989, fathers who stayed home were surveyed about why they stayed at home, and a similar survey was also carried out in 2012. And the father's responses are given, summarized below, with a multiple bar relative frequency graph. So they're giving um, relative frequencies, which we would think of as percentages in this one, instead of giving us the counts. And they've got the two bars here. The one on the left is for 1989, and the other one's for 2012. So 89, 2012, 89, 2012. And that allows us to see how the reasons that fathers stayed home with their children maybe were, were and have shifted over this time period. So let's see what kind of questions they have for us here. What percentage of the fathers in 2012 stayed, home, stayed at home because they were unable to find work? So unable to find work is right here. And it says what percentage, the relative frequency is marked on the bar, which is 0.23 but the relative frequency is the decimal form of the percentage, so we just need to shift that decimal over two spots and say it was 23%. And then I think the other thing that's natural to do when you have one of these multiple bar graphs is to think about um, how that changed from 89. So it looks like that's a higher percentage of fathers uh, in 89, or sorry, in 2012 saying the reason they stayed home is because they couldn't find work. That was only 15% back in 89. All right, let's move on to part B. From inspecting the multiple bar graph, a student concludes that 35% of all American fathers who stayed home in 2012 stayed at home because they were ill or disabled. What could you and would you tell that student? So let's see, uh, because they were ill or disabled. So ill or disabled is right here. And in 2012, that was indeed 0.35. So it seems like we would say, hey, good job to the student, right? So here's the tricky part about this. 
This is of all American fathers, it says. That's what they concluded. And let's see what it says back here. In 1989, fathers who stayed home were surveyed. Okay, So what that means, what that implies, is that because these were surveys in both years, they probably didn't actually ask every father who stayed home, but they randomly sampled some and asked them. And whenever you do that sort of work in statistics, and we'll find out a lot more about this when we get to stat, is we're just making an estimate uh, about the truth rather than knowing the truth for all Americans. We know what it was for our survey, but we don't know what it was for all Americans. So what would I tell that student? Uh, right idea, but not quite. So 35% of the fathers surveyed said this. Thirty-five percent is just an estimate for all fathers. And we'll learn more in statistics about how good these estimates are. Um, but one of the things we'll learn is they're not perfect. So it's probably not true that it was exactly 35% of all American fathers in 2012. But if this was a fairly large random sample, that's probably a pretty good estimate. And then which reason would you say changed the most from 89 to 2012? So this can be a little tricky. Uh, because you, you can look at it two ways. Um, you can look at how different are the numbers. So like the difference between the numbers here, let me bring in a different color to talk about this. So the difference here between the 0.21 and the 0.05 is 0.16. The difference here is 0.08. And let's see, between 0.56 and 0.35, the difference there is 0.21. And this one is only 0.03. So there's a temptation, I would think, to just say the biggest difference was with um, the percentage that stayed home because they were ill or disabled. And that's true in terms of that's the biggest difference in percentage points, 21 percentage points. But if you look at the ratio, I think that's a bigger difference for this one, caring for home or family because that's four times as high now. And if you look at this, four times as high as this would have been 1.40, nowhere near that, right? So I think the most dramatic change was in caring for home and family. That was only 5% uh, back in 89, but that's 21% now, almost four times as large. So let me say a couple things there. Uh, the reason for ill or disabled changed by 21% from the 0.21 that we got. And even though the one for home, caring for home slash family, I'll just call that one caring because we don't have a lot of space here. Even though caring was only 16% change that represented over a four times increase. So just because something had the biggest percentage change doesn't mean it was necessarily like the one that changed the most. I would think that the relative change there that you changed by 16% when it used by 16% when it used to be 5% uh, is a bigger deal than when you change by 21% and it used to be 56 kind of going back to that idea of absolute change versus relative change that we talked about way back early in the course all right and let's look at one last question here why is it important that this bar graph be given as relative frequency rather than as a frequency bar graph so one of the things that's important to think about is the number of fathers that stayed home between 89 and 2012 might be very, very different. Um, 
maybe there was a hundred thousand that stayed home here and then six hundred thousand that stayed home here if that's the case and I'm just making up those numbers but if there was you know six times more fathers staying home in 2012 and you did it by counts then all the bars would be bigger in 2012 every single one of them and so you can't really tell um, how the reasons are shifting if you're dealing with different population sizes but when you do relative frequency you're thinking of them all out of that total of hundred percent and it makes it easier to compare so putting that down in words here the population sizes may be different you know in fact they're almost certainly different and those different population sizes makes it harder to compare counts All right, but if we stick with percentages, both have the same total, 100%, and that makes it a lot better for making comparisons. All right, that wraps up section 13.1.